The word roguelike is often thrown around in the gaming community, more specifically in the indie game community. The genre has exploded over the years, with loads of developers taking the style and expanding upon it in ways that have changed the trajectory of indie games' popularity and influence in the gaming scene. Games like Splunky, a classic, Hades nominated for Game of the Year in 2020, and who can forget about The Binding of Isaac? That game is about as solid as the new 3DS's nipple they claimed as a joystick, and <laughs> oh boy, was that thing solid. Over the years, I've come to know and enjoy the genre a lot. It's one of the most vital pieces to the indie game space. I've been on a roguelike kick lately, and I'm not just saying like any kick, I'm talking like a freaking drop kick. Oh my gosh. <coughs> so, yeah, um, <coughs> lots of my uh, spare time has evolved around this genre as of late. Uh, they're fun, addicting, extremely challenging, and if done right, they can have endless amounts of replayability. Now, I said I was addicted to the genre, which means I've been playing not one, but multiple games involving this style. Not only can you easily sink hours upon hours into most roguelikes you come across, but there's just so many to choose from. I mean, just look at this. This isn't stopping anytime soon. Okay, okay, I think, I think we get it now. <laughs> okay. All right, I think we got it. I have a decent collection of these bad boys, and within the collection, a handful of them have piqued my interests and have generated some thoughts that I really just want to get off my chest. Oh, you, you thought metaphorically. <laughs> well, I guess that too, but anyways, today I have handpicked four different roguelikes that I want to share my thoughts and feelings with, ranging from the more traditional-ish to the more unique. Think of it as a review event slash marathon, whatever floats your boat. But before we begin, in case some of you aren't as cultured in the gaming scene, I wanted to take a brief moment and ask the question, what exactly is a rogue like? Well, hope you're taking notes, cause uh, class is now in session. The term roguelike originates from a 1980 text terminal computer game, Rogue, where you would explore randomly generated floors of a dungeon, collect items, and fight hostile letters. For its time, it was very impressive, and the randomly generated elements made for a seamlessly endless experience. It was this game that gave birth to a whole genre of its own and spawned countless games after its release that were very similar, hence the name Rogue Likes. Now jump to the present, and roguelikes are boiled down to essentially two main components in their design. Number one is randomly generated levels, which means every run should be different and unique from the last. And number two is permadeath, meaning once you die, you restart from the beginning and all progress is reset. This creates a run-based system, where you start with the same exact things every run, and due to the randomly generated elements, it should be a different experience every time you play. These two components, combined with the run-based system, makes for an extremely addicting, challenging, and surprising formula that's both really replayable and really rewarding. Now, the way people define roguelikes nowadays is up to debate. Rogue started off as a grid-based RPG dungeon crawler, but as time went on and games and developers started to evolve, the roguelike genre began to expand and developers started to add their own twists and characteristics to the genre. More and more games were shying away from the old dungeon RPG stuff and instead based their gameplay and theming off things like zombie apocalyptic road trips. You know, the usual. Some of these games stray away from the original formula a lot and are known as rogue lights. So with every new roguelike that comes out, there's always a debate on whether or not it's technically a roguelike or a rogue light. Some are far from the original design, others are close. There's so many factors to consider, it's kind of just becoming a gray area more and more over time. Yeah, I know it's complicated, but in my opinion, the way people justify roguelikes nowadays is if they have these two main components, randomly generated aspects and permadeath. Anything beyond that is really up for debate. But for the sake of simplicity, I'll be referring to everything here on out as rogue likes, even though they may not qualify as one Technically, I hope you're okay with that. But with all that being said, I have quite a few games to cover. So sit back, relax, and let's get on with the first roguelike. Uh, 
Okay, Shovel Knight himself needs no introduction. You've seen him, everybody loves him, he's an indie icon. Practically everyone and their mother has played through Treasure Trove, but this? This isn't your typical Shovel Knight adventure. When this game was announced, I was intrigued for sure. I didn't really know what to think. It looked really fun, but you could say I was cautiously optimistic. There were a lot of questions surrounding it. The title made it sound like it was a mobile game. I didn't really know how it worked, but all those questions were answered when the game launched on December 13th, 2021. So, uh, what are we waiting for? Let's dig in, shall we? <laughs> Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon is a falling block puzzler action roguelike hybrid. Gosh, that's a mouthful. The goal is simple. Your job is to clear out enough enemies to pass the threshold to release the dungeon level's exit. The way you go about doing that is by moving around and bumping into enemies to damage and kill them. But you gotta be careful, because your enemies aren't the only ones with HP, and if you die, it's over. Every time you attack, you trade hits with one another, and so it turns into a game of strategic management of managing your health and healing with potions, while also trying to clear out enemies to progress to the next level. Every enemy type deals a different amount of damage, and some can be challenging and even inefficient when trying to kill them by themselves. And this is where chains come into play. When a group of the same enemy type is touching, bumping into them affects them all, causing chain damage to the group. This also adds an element of strategy, where you're trying to set up groups and chains to enemy types, that way you're not taking up as much damage as you would if they were all separated. The concept of the player moving around the playing field instead of controlling the falling blocks isn't really seen all too often in the puzzle genre. The only comparison I can really think of is Wario's Woods, and considering this obscure 1994 comparison is the only one I can think of, it's safe to say that this style is still fairly new. Another plus the game has is the pacing is set by you. Your movement is grid-based, and every time you shift, everything else also shifts. Time will pass on its own, but it can also be sped up based on how fast you're moving around. Although you can set the pace, the game rewards fast action. There's a gem meter on the bottom here that slowly depletes if enemies aren't being killed, and so the faster you go around killing enemies, the more the meter fills up, which in turn rewards you with more gems. With those gems, along the adventure you'll find shops where you can purchase relics that give passive abilities to help you out each run. As you can see, there is a lot going on here. This game is really unique in its design. So unique, in fact, it took me a good while to fully understand it. And for the first few hours of me playing, it became very difficult to gain any sort of progression, which was kind of frustrating from time to time. It wasn't really bad design, it just had such a weird learning curve which made it pretty difficult to understand, even with the tutorials given to you. And to further emphasize my point, I've been playing clips of me dying this whole time. And, and it's still going. Now, luckily there are tons of options and customization to adjust the difficulty to your liking. Only problem I had was I didn't adjust one thing, and looking back, I probably should have just swallowed my pride and looked at the settings. I most likely wouldn't have had as much of a tough time as I did. But what I will say is once you get a good grasp of how the game works, good gravy is it addicting! It is so satisfying running around destroying chains of enemies while you're loading up with cash, and it doesn't help that the visuals and animation further emphasize that satisfaction. I mean, the game looks phenomenal. Couple that with an amazing soundtrack, and you got a game that overall just feels amazing. They threw a handful of remixes from previous Shovel Knight games, and some of these are outright certified bangers. There's no doubt that they nailed the presentation and feel, but when it comes to its core roguelike mechanics, it's a little weaker in comparison to most. How the whole adventure works is you're tasked with facing 10 different dungeons all in the same order every time you play. It's what's in those dungeons that add random elements to your run. Only problem is there's not too many factors that can be randomized. I mean, obviously the enemies that drop are, but that's really how every falling block puzzler works, so uh, there's really nothing new there. The items you find in the relic shops you come across are where the game really feels more like a roguelike. The temporary items are just your typical limited upgrades. Increase in damage, increase in attack range, some do giant radius damage, others gives you more defense, etc, etc. Most temporary items are found in chests that require keys to access, while the relic shops are found in almost every dungeon and contain a random selection of abilities to purchase. 
things like poison effects on your attacks or damage resistant to bombs. One of my favorite things about roguelikes is the excitement of seeing what abilities you get and how different your character becomes every time you play. And I think the relics do a pretty good job at that. I guess really my biggest complaint with them is it seems like you get a lot of recurring relics every new run. It's almost like there's not enough of them to throw into the pool to mix it up every time. And looking at the list, there's not the biggest selection. Same with the normal items or even the list of enemies. I just think it would have been nice to have more content in terms of variety and randomization in the relics, items, enemies, or even the dungeons. Every dungeon has a decently good variety of enemies, each with their own flair to them. Like take for example these golden armors. Wherever you attack them, they put their shield in that direction, making so you have to go around them to deal any more damage. Another example are these swarm bees that do more damage if they're adjacent to each other. So the best way to kill them is by actually killing them separately. Although there are a pretty good amount of enemies, it would have been nice to see some variation within the enemy types. It also would have been nice to have some random events or hazards in the dungeons to mix up the run from time to time. The closest thing we have to that are these portals you can find in every dungeon. And for the most part, they kind of just contain this tiny little puzzle to clear out that rewards you with some gems but they all feel really samey, and most of the time I felt like they weren't even worth going for. There's a couple of different things in minigames that can happen in there, but for some reason in my time playing, those were very rare, and I would just get stuck with the same old, tiny puzzles. I guess what it boils down to is the game not feeling like it has enough content to satisfy its roguelike design. And the main campaign is pretty short too, even with it having multiple endings, and each run can kind of feel the same. But it's weird, because at its core, the game mechanics and puzzle elements are phenomenal. I love it. It's incredibly addicting, but it kind of feels like the roguelike side of things was either an afterthought or just didn't get as much attention. I know it may sound like I'm being a bit harsh on the game, but again, I can't stress this enough. I love it. It's literally one of the most satisfying puzzle games I've ever played. Once you get a feel for how the game works, it's so fun running around and setting up combos and destroying chains, all while doing it at lightning fast speeds. It's super satisfying fast paced action, and to me, that's a great combination. Even though it may not have as many factors to a typical roguelike than I would prefer, I think it does a good job at keeping things fresh and exciting for what it has. They have tons of different characters to choose from, all with different abilities and stats. That alone adds a ton of replayability, and they all have very distinct playstyles which mixes up the core gameplay enough to make it feel fresh and different from other runs. Oh, and I haven't even talked about the bosses, and yes, a puzzle game with bosses. That is unheard of. I really enjoyed these. It was a nice change from the typical puzzle portions, and I thought they were all very well designed and unique. It was cool seeing how they attacked, how they messed with the arena around you. Again, it was a nice change of pace. When it comes to difficulty, it is not slept on. This game can be brutal, which can appeal to some, but also, like mentioned earlier, the game has a ton of options to adjust the game to however you want it to play like. Even the roguelike playstyle can be toggled on and off if you're more in favor of a typical puzzle game experience. I really liked Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon. Even though it may sound like a mobile game, it's far from that. It's polished, super addicting, super innovative, and a very fun experience. Yes, it may suffer from lack of content in some areas, but the core gameplay is hard to beat, and DLC is officially planned, so who knows, maybe that'll boost its content up to normal roguelike standards. Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon is unlike most games out there. As a puzzle game, it's fantastic. As a roguelike, it's pretty alright. But I would be doing you guys a disservice if I didn't recommend this game. Now, if you thought this roguelike was different, wait till you see this next one. This game differs from the typical roguelike formula a lot, but in a good way. Rounds is a chaotic multiplayer mess, and I love it. I'm gonna be completely honest and say that this game is the main thing that inspired this video, hands down. The game is a 1v1 shooter where you and another opponent duke it out in a classic competitive fight to the death. First one to win two matches wins a round, and the first to win five rounds is victorious. Oh, that makes so much more sense now. Well, that's not the only reason it's called rounds. On the surface, it's a pretty standard 1v1 shooter. You can move around, jump, wall jump, shoot, even reflect bullets if timed right. 
But here's the catch. At the start of every game, each player gets to pick an ability. This can range from explosive bullets to increasing bullet speed, upgrading your gun to fully automatic, and so on and so forth. What's crazy is every round you lose, you gain an ability to help you counter your opponent. And with every progressive round, powers stack, making for some really insane combinations and fights. And the abilities aren't just limited to your gun. There's things for blocking, movement, health, everything. There's a wide range of cards to work with, and every single one can be mixed and combined together. One of my favorite things about this is it encourages you to experiment, especially because each selection of abilities is randomized every round. There's some rounds that your class can be extremely OP, while others can get too chaotic and self-harming it comes right back and bites you on the butt. It's great, because it feels like it goes either way with those two outcomes every single match. The equation of losing equals buff is genius. For starters, it makes losing exciting. It doesn't feel like a drag, it boosts the chaos, and you get another ability to play around with. It's a literal win for one player, but also a win for the losing one. Also, if a player is better than the other, or a specific class is just too good, you always get a chance to counter that class or just become stronger in general. And because of this, almost every game leads up to the final match, and it's just so intense and chaotic and only six bucks on Steam. Like, why are you even still here? Just just go buy it. Just, just go over and click the add the cart button. With it having a small price tag, the game is pretty small. Lack of content is its main issue for sure. The standard 1v1 mode is the only game mode, and the only other factor you can change is if it's played locally or online. There is a sandbox mode where you can mess around with certain abilities to see what they do, but even that is bare bones and not very user friendly. The game's been out for a long time now, and we haven't seen any post-game support whatsoever. At least give us some more cards, a 2v2 mode, some customization, even a single player survival mode would have been nice. You can only play the 1v1 mode for so long and after a while you get to know the best combinations and cards. Seeing as though the game hasn't been updated for this long, I don't see them doing it anytime soon. Luckily, the rounds community has stepped up and have tons of mods and custom map support. There seems to be a pretty decently sized community pushing the game further and further. I have tried these before and they're pretty fun. Things can get insanely chaotic, even game breaking. There's mods for more cards, maps, even card selecting customization, which is super sweet. It's great to see the community supporting the game, but in the end, I wish the original game just had more accessible content and updates. Also, the game is only available on Steam. It does support local play with controllers, but the game heavily favors keyboard and mouse. I will say, when playing with PC controls, though, it feels great. Movement feels snappy and fluent, aiming is precise, and overall the platforming feels really solid and I couldn't see myself playing it any other way. I'm just saying, if you're going to play with a friend, it's probably best to play online on separate PCs. That way you both get better control schemes and the full rounds experience. But anyways, all that to say, I think Rounds is incredibly fun and incredibly underrated. The base game is lacking content, sure, but I really can't argue with that $6 price tag. If you're looking for a fun game to play with friends, or just a fun game to play with random people, I can't recommend Rounds enough. It's chaotic, intense, and will give you hours of entertainment even with that cheap price tag. And if you're looking for more outside the base game, the modding community is still going strong as of making this video. So, if you're a fan of 1v1 chaotic shooters, this is a no-brainer. It may not fall under the typical roguelike guidelines as much, but without a doubt, it's definitely been one of my favorites lately. Tumble Seed is a weird roguelike, period. If fast-paced chaos isn't your cup of tea, then you might be interested in this one. But okay, first off, who comes up with this stuff? Tumble Seed? Sounds like someone had an oopsie in the developer's office and was like, Oh crap, I tumbled my seeds! I bought this game way back in the earlier days of the Switch. You know, the days when this was more like this? My library was little to nothing at the time, but I saw this bad boy in the eShop and thought, you know what, why not? I bought the game, played it for a couple hours, and never really touched it again. 
until now. Tumble Seed is one of the most unique roguelikes I have ever seen. Unlike most roguelikes that are fast and super action-packed, Tumble Seed goes for the more slow and methodical precise type approach. The goal is pretty straightforward, or I guess in this case straight up. You take control of this little seed trying to scale all the way up to the tippity top of this giant mountain. The whole game is basically a balancing act. You use the right and left joysticks to move each end of this balance bar up and down to roll and tumble and maneuver your seed upwards to the end goal. Only problem is each section of the mountain has a variety of hazards that make the process of scaling a bit more difficult. There's tons of holes to avoid, enemies that try to shoot you, snakes that try to eat you, and all of this is happening while you have the constant pressure of just keeping your seed stable. Yeah, for being a slow, methodical game about seeds of all things, it really knows how to stimulate your anxiety a bit. But not for me, though. The only thing that scares me is the game's controls. Okay, it's not the worst thing in the world, it just took me a good chunk of time to get used to. I've never really controlled the game quite like it, you know, controlling each side of the bar with each joystick. It just felt very uncomfortable to me. I don't know if it was just me, but it took me a long time to get the hang of just simply getting my character to stay still. I would say after breaking through the barrier of the weird control scheme is when the game actually becomes a more enjoyable experience. How long will that take? I can't answer that. One thing I will say is the game in general is pretty difficult, mainly because of the weird way it handles. There's tons of different factors that can damage or mess you up, and one slight hiccup can end a run for good. Although once you get a feel for it, it does get pretty satisfying navigating through each part of the mountain. Before hopping right into the main roguelike mode, the game does offer pre-made levels to get a feel of how the game works and controls. This is very needed, and I'm glad they offered these, especially with the steep learning curve of the game's movement. Not only is it a nice gradual warm-up for the standard roguelike mode, but you also get a good feel for what each section of the mountain has in store. That includes the terrain, different enemy types, and different seed types. Well, I guess that other word in the title is there for a reason. At the start of each run, you're given four essential starting abilities that you can cycle through at any time. The way you use each ability is by planting them in any of these soil patches you see everywhere while scaling the mountain. However, every seed costs crystals to use, and you'll find them scattered around or by killing enemies. You got the flag seed, which plants a checkpoint. That way, when you fall into a hole, you respawn back at the point rather than further down or at the end of the mountain. The thorn seed gives you one spike every time you plant that can be used mainly for protection or for attacking. The crystal seed is the only starting ability that's free to use and gives you a couple of crystals per every three soil patches planted. And finally, the heart seed heals one HP for every four soil patches planted. These are your four main seed types, but along the way up, you'll also find these seed chambers that let you choose between two random abilities to add to your arsenal. There's actually a pretty wide range of seed types. Most of them help you out offensively, giving you ranged or melee attacks, but there's also some mobility and defensive and even environmental types thrown in the mix as well. There's a good amount of them to where it keeps things fresh every run, but not an overwhelming amount to the point where you can't learn to use them to the best of their ability. This is probably my favorite aspect of the game. I like the management of what seeds slash power-ups to plant. It makes encountering obstacles and upcoming parts of the mountain more strategic. Once you plant a seed in a soil patch, it's done. You can't use it again, so in most situations you have to carefully plan which seed you want to use. Although I really like this concept and idea, I will admit that it can make the overall gameplay feel a bit too slow for me personally. You probably already know this based on the two previous games I've mentioned, but I'm more of a fan of fast-paced action, especially when it comes to roguelikes, and Tumble Seed, well, uh, just look at it. Not exactly the uh, job description I want. One plus with the slower gameplay though, is it can make the game feel more intense at times. Scaling up the mountain with one heart while trying to avoid holes with extreme precision can get your heart beaten pretty fast. I respect the concept and I don't hate it, I just prefer a little quicker action. One thing I have no problems with is the simplistic art style. Visually, it's pretty appealing. I really dig the aesthetic and vibe it's going for. The soundtrack on the other hand is a different story. Most of the tracks in this game aren't that catchy. They mostly consist of having light tunes with exotic noises and stuff mixed in. And uh, it's not my favorite. I get what the game is going for, and it does have some good sound design, but the music overall feels a bit sporadic and kind of sounds like a jumbled mess of noises with a hint of a backtrack. 
It's unique, I'll give it that. Just not very appealing if you ask me. My experience with Tumbleseed was kind of like a seed itself. At first it was small, I wasn't too big of a fan of it. I had some growing pains, it was hard, I wasn't liking the controls. But after watering it a bit and playing it more and more, my enjoyment for it started to grow. And after a few hours of playing it, my metaphorical seed sprouted into an average sized sapling. This game is a 6.4 out of 10. I've said it once and I'll say it again, Tumbleseed is unlike any roguelike I have seen. And I know I've been saying that a lot, but it's true. And I can respect that. My feelings for the game were a bit unbalanced at first. I liked the concept, but the steep learning curve and difficulty made it pretty frustrating at times. But the more I played it, the more I grew to enjoy it. If you can get past the interesting controls, I think you can have a pretty good time with this one. It's got some fun ideas, interesting strategic elements, and some pretty good roguelike mechanics. If you're into slow paced games, gardening, and all the above, literally, Tumbleseed might just be the game for you. Enter the Gungeon, oh boy. Out of all the games presented today, this is probably one you've heard of. It really doesn't need much introduction. Whenever roguelikes are mentioned, this is one that's often brought up as one of the best. Developed by Dodge Roll and released in 2016, Enter the Gungeon is still one of the greatest roguelikes today. It's also one of the more normal roguelikes I'm looking at today. The game has you going through randomly generated dungeons, killing everything in sight, and if you die, the run ends, rinse, and repeat. But you aren't just in any ordinary dungeon. This is a gungeon. What that means is every single thing involves guns. Your weapons are guns. Your money is gun shells. Your hearts are gun shells. The enemies themselves are literal gun shells that, that have guns that are, that are shooting. And I don't know if you've noticed, but this game has a serious gun obsession. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is if you're looking to play this game in North Korea, well, good luck. Since we're kind of on the topic, I want to talk about the guns themselves. There are over 200 different guns that you can use in this game, and with each run being randomized, the likelihood of you using every single one across your whole playtime isn't the highest. You'll have to play a very long time to make that happen. And that's not even including all the passive abilities that can change, hinder, or even upgrade your guns. When it comes to content, the game is like a Gatling gun. It never stops. Seriously though, they really outdid themselves with the amount of content they have in the game. It has tons of enemies to fight, tons of weapons and abilities to find, lots of different bosses, which are super well designed by the way, lots of random events and NPCs you can interact with throughout each run, and it's just one thing after another. When roguelikes have one of their selling points as each run is different every time, this is a game where I actually believe that to be true, especially with the diverse and insane amount of weapons it has. They have guns like the NES Zapper, Mega Man's Arm Cannon, Ghostbusters Proton Pack, and the Aura Gunny. It's an origami gun that shoots freaking paper. The game wouldn't be nearly as good if they took themselves seriously and used actual real life guns. And while it does do that, 80% of the guns listed are either pop culture references, completely random objects, or just genuine funny gags. In the words of the Steam user Greyboy the Great, this game has more puns than your uncle on Thanksgiving. I couldn't have said it better myself. The whole game in general is pretty humorous. Character designs are derpy and silly, and every boss has a punny name. Its non-serious nature makes it very charming, even though the dungeon settings have darker and dirtier tones for the most part. The animations and art style are beautiful and super smooth. With a genre like a bullet hell, it's important to have the game easy to understand visually and have lots of indicators of enemies' attacks, and I thought they did an incredible job with that. The gameplay is also very smooth and responsive. It never really feels like it's the game's fault when you die. It's really all about skill and reaction time. That also carries into the boss and enemy design as well. Yes, there are your really annoying enemies you have to face, but I wouldn't really say they're unfair. The way you deal with most enemies is by learning their attacks and movements. Same with the bosses. I wouldn't really say they're overpowered, just very difficult at times, especially if your arsenal of weapons isn't the best. The game is never slow either. There's constant action happening every single room and about the only time you get a breather is in the shopkeeper's room. And sometimes I've found myself literally taking a breather. 
Killing enemies is very rewarding and dodging bullets feels super satisfying. One of my favorite aspects to the combat is the interactable objects you can use throughout most rooms of the dungeon. There's explosive barrels you can roll towards enemies, tables you can flip for cover or slide over, Dukes of Hazard style, and using these to your advantage is very satisfying to pull off. It makes the dungeon feel more immersive and alive. It doesn't feel like a blank collection of empty rooms and stuff for cosmetics. You actually feel like you're exploring a tangible dungeon. As you've probably seen and heard, I haven't really talked about a lot of gripes I have with Enter the Gungeon. And that's because, well, uh, there really isn't any. I mean, the only thing I can really think of is the difficulty could shy away a lot of casual players because I will say, the deeper you get into the dungeon, man, can it get pretty intense as seen right here. With that difficulty comes confusion at times, and certain items, guns, dungeon events aren't really explained to you that well and can make the game kind of frustrating if you don't know what you're doing. But I know for some, that can also be all part of the fun, figuring out things on your own and being surprised. I just know with a more difficult game like this, it's nice to know the full extent of what certain items do and how NPCs benefit each run. So if you want more info and help on the game, the wiki can be a lifesaver. One other minor gripe I had is the co-op mode is locked behind a specific character, meaning the second player is only allowed to play as this purple dude. But looking into it a bit further, the second player isn't limited to anything. Even though they may not have any of the other specific character abilities, overall it's just another character to use. Although I think it would have been nice if the second player had the option to choose someone else. I don't know, at this point I'm just being very nitpicky. In conclusion, Enter the Gungeon is an amazing roguelike filled with loads of content, humor, and difficult satisfaction. I know the bullet hell elements and the hardcore enemies and bosses can scare off new players, but once you master the controls, it really gets more and more manageable. And if you're really wanting something to sink your teeth into, this game is filled to the brim. I know people that have hundreds of hours clocked in and are still finding new stuff. It's good, it's fun, and I highly recommend giving it a shot. Wait, hold up. Well, that about does it for my roguelike bonanza. There are loads of roguelikes out there. I haven't even scratched the surface, but these roguelikes I shared today were very unique and different to me, and I enjoyed my time with them. But I'm very tired, so uh, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. If you want to support me in any other way, just liking, subscribing, and sharing is always greatly appreciated. But again, I'm very tired, so thank you so much for watching, and I will hopefully see you guys here soon. Thanks again.